you are the first World War II veteran I've had the pleasure of taking to lunch. So uh, I can't say enough, my grandfather being a World War II veteran, how honored I am to have you here with me today. So thank you for taking time out of your day. Thank you. So I guess uh, let's start. What, uh, the, what part of the military did you serve for? Should I say arigato? Yeah. <laughs> arigato works too. So. Come up some later? Yeah. Huh? Come up some later? Yeah. Korean? Yeah. I don't know Korean. I did take Japanese in uh, college though. So I know a little bit of Japanese. All I know is what I picked up when I was in Korea. Yeah. We were surprised when we got there. They were all speaking Japanese. Mm -hmm. They'd been under Japanese rule for 35 years, and Japanese said, you will speak Japanese. Mm -hmm. When did you enlist into the uh, military? When did you enlist? Were you drafted into? I was drafted. The 4th of December, 1943, went into active service the 27th of December. Into the Army, correct? Yeah, Army Medical Department. Wow. What did you do in the Army Medical? Drove a truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So you, you went to, during World War II, I'm assuming you went to the Pacific. I was in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Two years without a break. Wow. They don't do that much anymore, no, do they? they? Not don't. anymore. No. They got to give you a break. Well, they shipped me clear down to New Caledonia. You know where that is? Mm-hmm. Kept me there seven months in a replacement camp. They discovered they couldn't assign us from down there. So... They shipped a bunch of us back to the Hawaiian Islands, Schofield Barracks. Okay. We formed the 80th Medical Group there, which was a headquarters outfit. And soon we got all of our people and our equipment right to Okinawa. Wow. But I was back with 10th Army Headquarters. I didn't see any combat. So... During your time during World War II? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you said you were stationed in Korea? After the Japanese surrendered, our commanding officer got us together and told us, well, we're going to Korea for six months of occupation. Okay. Well, I knew where Korea was. But we had a motor sergeant. He was a real hick. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> He was from down south of here somewhere. Uh -huh. And he asked me, well, where is Korea anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I explained to him where it was, but I don't know whether he understood or not. <laughs> so, uh, tell me some of your experiences. I mean, I, I bet, I, I imagine, and we were talking before, um, that when you got to Korea, most of all of them spoke Japanese because that was how the imperialist Japanese wanted it. I mean, yeah. they just spread them as far as they could. Yeah, they tried to make Japanese out of them. Yeah, absolutely. So I bet it was a very interesting situation once you got there. We landed at Incheon, where there's a 32-foot tide. Uh-huh, wow. You have to come in at high tide, go into the tidal basin, they shut the gates, you can't go out until high tide again. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. I bet in Korea now is a completely different world than it was. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it was. The city of Seoul, Korea didn't even have a sewage system. Wow. <laughs> it just ran down the... Wow. Down and then you look at pictures street. now and it looks like state of the art and just incredible how fast it just switches you know that's just incredible that's incredible and they told us when we got off of the ship be sure and drive on the left yeah oh be, yeah yeah <laughs> that makes sense just, too just after i left there they switched them over yeah to the right you know that would be a mess oh my god oh my goodness and the only transportation those koreans had was ox cart 
Wow. Wow. And we're talking so like late 40s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. I was 44. Yeah. And how fast it just flipped, you know? That's just unbelievable. It's mind boggling. Yeah. So, how long were you in the service for? How long? Mm hmm. Well, I went in 27th of December. I got out the 13th of April. 46. 46. So, three years. My math right? Is that right? Three years? About that. Yeah, about three years. Gotcha. I got out on my father's birthday. Yeah? I got home the next day. That's cool. I bet he was excited. Oh, he said that was the best birthday present he ever had. That's awesome. That's incredible. Um, well, do you have any other experiences that you had that were just memorable or anything that you'd like to share? Well, one was on the way home. Okay. Just a few days out of Korea, there were three cases of smallpox broke out on the ship. Oh, goodness gracious. So they run us all through and vaccinated us. And it wasn't but two or three more days until they burned out a turbine on one of the drives. Oh, wow. Uh... Twin diesel engines burned out a turbine on one of those, one of the drive turbines. Uh -huh. And that slowed us down to less than half speed. Oh, wow. But by the time we got into San Francisco Harbor, we were still quarantined. Because of the smallpox. We sat there for eight days. After the trip? Oh, my God. Half speed and trip, and then you had to sit in. San day. Francisco Harbor over here, Alcatraz over here. And you just had to sit on the ship and look at it. But they gave us a treat. As you see, I'm a milk drinker. Uh -huh. They came alongside of us with a little boat loaded with five-gallon cans of milk. Yeah. Fresh milk. They hoisted it up, said, grab your canteen cups and get all the milk you want. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and, and humbling, too, because you think, like, the things that we take for granted, you know, I've got milk in my house right now. If I want cereal, no problem. To you... That was have been like gold, better than gold. I hadn't seen any fresh milk in all those years. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. Well, I'll tell you the story about that shipment to New Caledonia. Okay. There was a man by the name of Studebaker in charge of troop movements in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And he sent two shiploads down there. The General Robert L. Howes and the Laureline. Maybe you've heard of the Laureline. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Well, the Army leased that from the Princess Lines. Mm -hmm. They told them, take all your fixtures out and we'll put our stuff in it. Well, when they caught up with Mr. Studebaker, they pulled him up and court-martialed him. He was a full colonel, and when they got through with him, he was a second lieutenant. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Lost his cushy job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I was interviewed at the 13th replacement on Oahu, they looking at my records. Oh, you're one of Studebaker's men. I didn't know what they meant, yeah. what they were talking about. But later I heard you about it. You figured it out. I heard about it. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, I won't take up too much more of your time, Dale. I appreciate you for coming here today. Sally as well, thank you for taking time out of your day. And Sally is Dale's daughter who was kind enough to bring him with her. And uh, I, again, can't thank you enough for your service, what you've done for this country, and uh, your time today, sir. Well, if it hadn't been for us... The people on the West Coast would be speaking Japanese. Oh, yeah. And the rest of them would be speaking German. Yeah, on the other side. And to be honest with you, well, who knows what kind of world would it we be living in if it wasn't for your generation. You know what I mean? And that's, and I believe that wholeheartedly. And as you know, they call us the greatest generation. And, and that's deserved. 
Well, I didn't ask to go, but Uncle Sam said, I want you. Mm-hmm. And you did. I went. Yep. And everyone, your brothers and sisters and neighbors and co-workers and your friends, everyone did. Well, I went in as a conscientious objector. Mm-hmm. Our church called, didn't call us objectors. We called ourselves conscientious cooperators. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm very cool at the same time. So, yeah. Thank you. 